Hi everybody, it's time for our Bible study. It's Tuesday, August the 18th. My goodness, is summer going fast. May God's blessing be upon you as we take a look once again at our lesson. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. We ask your blessing on this lesson that you would reach us through it. Help us to reconcile as I think the lesson is directing us to do this day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I want to thank you for joining us. We have been just doing this continuous reading of the book of Genesis, participating in some of that on our Tuesday night Bible studies. Today is kind of a wrap-up of a lesson that we learned last week. If you remember last week, a little bit about the context. We learned about Joseph, who is a privileged, arrogant, uh, tattletaling, self-consumed crybaby. Okay? He was a jerk, in other words. He was not a perfect man. In fact, he was far from it. His brother sold him in slavery, and that was kind of a bad response to that. I mean, just because he was a jerk doesn't mean you sell your brother into slavery. So two wrongs don't make a right. But nevertheless, please understand that oftentimes when you read the Bible, the Bible is not always presenting characters who are perfect in character and should be uh, with the intention of being emulated. We should not be emulating Joseph, at least not from our lesson from last week. However, Joseph significantly transforms in his time in slavery. That flawed character of his, God is going to use as Joseph humbles himself. And that kind of comes up to today's lesson. Now, we jump ahead through quite a few chapters. We miss quite a few things in our lesson for today. But Joseph is humbled in his time as a slave in Egypt. He begins as a servant and ultimately is falsely accused of, in essence, having sex with his master's wife. That doesn't go over very well. He's thrown into prison. Uh, the, the key is thrown away. He thinks he's never going to see the light of day. He thinks he's going to die in prison. But there he's ultimately released because he has this vision about what God is going to do with it. Uh, country of Egypt, and uh, they see the wisdom of him. He, he proves himself uh, that he, has, he is excellent as a strategic planner for the future. And so the Pharaoh himself takes notice of Joseph. He's delivered from slavery. He becomes the right-hand man to the Pharaoh himself. And so he found, finds out from a revelation from God that Egypt is going to go through a period of seven and a half years of great blessing, followed by seven and a half years of incredibly severe famine. And so Joseph prepares Egypt for the famine. Through the good years, he begins to save and save and save enough food and supplies so that when the season of famine does come, Egypt becomes a blessing to the surrounding world. And so this is what this sets up for the story today. So Egypt now, this blessing to the world, guess what happens to Joseph's brothers? Remember, he's 11 brothers and his father, Jacob. They all, Jacob thinks that his son is dead. He's been living with that for years and years and years and years. This thought that his brother is gone. Now, uh, Joseph's brothers are struggling. They can't put food on the table. Remember, there's a massive famine. They say, hey, let's go to Egypt and see if we can't get some food. While in Egypt, Joseph sees them, but they don't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognizes his brothers. After all, think of it. If you're one of Joseph's brothers, you're not going to recognize a guy who's all adorned in this, uh, this um, regalia of of the, of, of uh, of, of royalty, because that's basically what Joseph has become. You're just not going to recognize that. You think your brother is gone. You think he's been a slave. You might even think he's probably dead by this point. So you don't think this is him. But Joseph recognizes his brothers, and he kind of plays a little bit of a trick on that. I'm not going to go into all of that, but long and the short, he tries to, he does this test of his brothers to make sure that they are still uh, faithful, to make sure that they have humble themselves. Because during this time, these years of imprisonment, Joseph has become a very humble servant. So again, we come to our lesson for today. Joseph finally decides after testing his brothers that they too have been humbled by the great loss that they have experienced, by their sorrow at what they did to their brother, 
And this is when Joseph realizes it's time to reveal himself. That's our lesson for today. So let me read to you this lesson of reconciliation. Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, have everyone leave this place. He's in, he's in a, a courtyard uh, with his brothers surrounded by all the servants. So he sends all the other servants out of the courtyard. And all he is is in front of these 11 brothers standing before him. There were no one with Joseph, and he then made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of the Pharaoh heard of it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. For they were dismayed at his presence. You know, they were dismayed. I love that word because basically they thought, oh my gosh, Joseph is going to get revenge on us for what we did to him so many years ago. They're afraid. <laughs> Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> but they came closer. And Joseph said, I'm your brother, Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. But don't be grieved or angry with yourselves. You sold me here. Because of that, God has sent me before you to preserve your life. For the famine has been in this land these two years, and there will be five more in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve you for a remnant in the earth, to keep alive by a great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his household, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down, do not delay. You shall live in the land of Goshen. You shall be near me, and you and your children, your children's children, your flocks and your herds, all that you have, and there I will also provide for you. For there are still five more years of famine yet to come, and you and your household, and all that you have, uh, you have would be impoverished. Behold your eyes, and see the eyes of my brother Benjamin. See, that is my mouth which is speaking to you. Remember, uh, Joseph, this kind of misses part of the lesson, Joseph actually had imprisoned Benjamin to try to test the brothers. And again, we didn't get into that lesson, but that's, that's in between last week's and this week's lesson. Joseph goes on, Now you must tell my father about all the splendor in Egypt and all that you've sent. You must hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and he wept. That's a, an idiomatic phrase. He basically grabbed him and hugged him. Benjamin wept on his neck. And he kissed all of his brothers and wept on them. And afterwards, his brothers talked with him. This is, this is a wonderful lesson of reconciliation. And I, I think we learn a couple of things that I think are really important for us today. That God uses the worst of circumstances in our life, oftentimes to bring a blessing. I don't think God necessarily creates the circumstance. We're living through a, a challenging time right now. Perhaps you are going through some difficulties in your life. But I find this to be of huge help. No matter what the circumstances of life, God's hand is upon us. This is what's wrong, by the way, with the prosperity gospel that is proclaimed only in the United States of America. Because only in the United States of America do we think the Bible is written directly to the United States. How stupid are we? And so we interpret it in a, in a very non-biblical fashion and come up with this prosperity doctrine that if you believe in God, God is going to prosper you, prosper you financially, materialistically. The Bible has nothing to do with material prosperity. If you're listening to a preacher preaching to you material prosperity, you need to get out of that church and find somewhere else to go. We live in a material world. But God transcends the material universe. It's not about material blessings. Having a relationship with God is no promise that you are not going to suffer. 
It's not a promise that you're not going to get sick and maybe even die. But here's my simple faith that I learned from this. If I live, I live to the Lord. Thanks be to God. If I get sick and I recover, it's all thanks to God. If I die, well, I'm in God's care. And then I receive my true healing. You see, healing and God's blessing is not about material blessings. Although oftentimes that is the way God shows and is revealed. And so certainly in this case, God was revealed through the blessing of overcoming of the famine because of the appropriate planning of Joseph. But it's not about the material blessings. God will use whatever circumstances of our life, whether we live whether we get sick, whether we die, we are in God's care, and ultimately, we are with God and not forgotten. That's the number one thing I learned from this lesson, powerful thing. Reject this prosperity doctrine. Reject any gospel that parades itself as some type of material blessing. We go on. Reconciliation. Huh. God's intention is for you and me to love each other and be reconciled to one another because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. I am brothers and sisters with you today. I don't always get along with all of you. You all don't always get along with me. There are times we drive each other crazy. There are times that I feel justified because you hurt me. I feel justified and maintaining a broken relationship with you until you come and repent. But here's what Joseph learned. Joseph was wronged by his brothers. Make no mistake. But Joseph was also an arrogant jerk who hurt his brothers as well. Two wrongs don't make a right. But Joseph had to be humbled before God, before uh, he could be a blessing to his brothers and to the world. We often feel wrong. Well, you know, what they did to me was so much worse. Well, yeah, I think what Joseph's brothers did to him was so much worse than what Joseph did to them. But you know what? Joseph was still wrong. And he had wronged his brothers. He too needed forgiveness as well as needing to forgive. He had to humble himself. I am asking you, I am begging and imploring you, my brothers and sisters, to stop inflaming division in this country. Stop inflaming heartache and pain. We've chosen sides and we're hitting each other like this. We need to be like this. It's all those, their fault. When you are got your finger out pointing at those people, you are part of the problem. Open up your fists. Humble yourself. Recognize that you have been a part of the division that exists between us. And let us reconcile with one another. I implore you. If you are one of those folks that's continually getting angry and posting political rubbish that sponsors your particular view and how all these people are evil and how we're so righteous and good, you may be a part of the problem. No, you're not maybe. You are a part of the problem. Open up your hands. And you're like, well, they don't want to reconcile with me. Well, you know, that's their problem. We are called to reconcile with one another. Open up your hand. And take the hand of the person with whom you've disagreed. Humble yourself. Recognize that you have been a part of the problem. And let us love one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the gift of Joseph, this story. But a very flawed 
arrogant man who humbled himself and became a blessing in this world. God, we're not going to be a blessing if we're arrogant. We're not going to be a blessing if we know we're right. We're only going to be able to be a blessing when we humble ourselves and reconcile with one another. Let us, your church, be those who are that gift of reconciliation. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.